All right, we are being recorded. So welcome everyone to our April 11th, 2023 edition of Tuesday Tech Talks. Uh, I am Clint Stevens, your I'm usual host, but not uh, this host for this time. We've got Chris Hot, my partner in crime and Canvas superior and <laughs> uh, media specialist in our office, who's going to take the lead today uh, and talk to us about some great resources. We lost Lisa. She's back. Oh. Um, she's back. And uh, for digital citizenship and information literacy in Nearpod. Nope. She's having an issue. So okay. thanks, Chris. I'll turn the time over to you. Thanks, Clint. Always great to be here. So this is one of the questions that we get from teachers all the time. How do I teach all of this all of the time? There's so much in information literacy and digital citizenship. For years, it's been, we'll teach it by a net safe assembly. We'll come out once a year and we'll do an assembly. Clint and I have done tons of those. Um, and it's we're finally starting to see a lot of that turn now. And, and a lot of that, I think, was COVID. A lot of people says, you know, once they started teaching more online and, and kids had more Chromebooks, they saw the need for that. So we're seeing that trend to have it be integrated with the classroom. And, and I think that's a really good spot to be in because this is a conversation we should have all the time with kids. And it's not always digital citizenship, it's just citizenship in general. So if we have classroom norms and rules um, for in-person in the classroom, why shouldn't we have something similar for when we're online? So teaching those kids that it's not different when you're online, you have the same expectations. Um, but some of the stuff is it's completely new to you. So maybe if you're not on social media or you're not online all the time, there's a lot of things that you don't know really how to discuss with the kids. And that's what I really love about Nearpod. It has some content that gives just gives some starting points. Um, so when you use Nearpod for digital citizenship, media literacy, or any of the content areas, there's some great things that you can help by engaging the students. Um, you, there's a lot of great videos and uh, open-ended questions that you could use just to spark a conversation. So just by showing a short Nearpod lesson may only take 10 minutes of your day, but you're going to start that conversation going. Um, Nearpod allows students to participate. They can participate anonymously and using uh, the, the boards. They can post up comments, and that's a great way. See what the kids are saying especially those kids that don't want to raise their hand a lot or you know, be, be known. They can put in um, anonymous comments in there. Nearpod can be used on the fly. Um, and if you've seen some of our other tech talks, we've talked about a lot of these tools, so we won't spend a lot of time on those, but there's places where you can just do a quick launch and just do a quick assessment question. Did everybody get that? And everybody can respond. Um, of course, you, know, you can do them student or teacher paced. Uh, you can also embed it in Canvas, which is great because you can use a lot of this for teaching content and assessment content. One Clint, caveat, was, though. What's that? If you are doing digital citizenship and there's sensitive questions, I would stray away from embedding it in Canvas because that locks in their, it, it ties their response to them, which is nice oh. for 95% of the time <laughs> you're using right. your pod, but um yeah. Just if, if you if you do have some of those sensitive you know, questions, sensitive questions, things like that, I would just yeah. use it by itself and not in Canvas. And that's true. And then if you decided you didn't want those sensitive questions, Nearpod is super easy to edit. You can just delete that slide and maybe just have that yeah. be a verbal conversation in your mm -hmm. classroom. Great point, Clint. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of it. If you don't really like that content, then you don't have to use it. You can edit it and adjust it to however you want. It's not like teachers pay teachers where you get that PDF and that's the only way you can use it. Here, you can add things that are maybe relevant to your socioeconomic level or your student's grade, their uh, you know, wh whatever kind of concerns, um, especially like right now, TikTok is a big thing. Well, there's a specific one for talking about TikTok. So you can really kind of, when you have those issues with social media or lack of digital citizenship skills, you can bring these in on those particular topics and just open up that conversation. Um, then, like we said, well, you can use it for a substitute. These are great to have uh, for a substitute to be able to use and administer. And then the nice thing is students get a copy. And, and like Clint says, you probably may not want some of that 
in in there where it's documented, but you can uh, have the students will get a copy and they can also use the Google Doc to follow up on questions or you can use it for following assessments. So finding content is super easy. And here's a video here that shows you how, but we're just gonna go ahead and dive in and show some of the places where you can get content. Uh, in this sure. video, you will learn how to find content we're not going to do that. So we're going to go straight to Nearpod. And once you've logged into Nearpod, and I think um, everybody should have been able to log in and have know the basics of Nearpod. If not, we've got some earlier ones on how to use the specific tools. But first, you want to come up here to your the little icon. If you don't have a picture, it'll just be the blue Nearpod icon. And look and make sure it says Premium Plus, because that's what you're going to need to be able to access um, the extended content that UEM has purchased. So every educator in Utah has this premium license. You might have to talk to your district admin if that's not showing or reach out to Clint or I and we can help you. So once we're in here, we have my lessons and that's just the repository of the lessons that I've kept in here that I've used and looked at and so you can see it's super easy. I just either want, whether I want to do it live or a student paste. Student paste is where you would do it in Canvas because everybody's going to be taken at the same time. Live participation is if you were teaching it in the classroom and you wanted to control the pace of the slides. Still um, usable in Canvas. You can control yeah. right with, within Canvas. Right, right. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. But yeah, my point was on Canvas, if you do the student pace, then students can do it whenever they want. So thanks, thanks for clar clarifying that. Um, and so then if you come down here, you, your school or district may have set up a library, but what you wanna look at here, first we'll look at the Nearpod library. And when you look at this library, there is a ton of resources in here. Um, there's a whole bunch of videos on how to use Nearpod. So even if you don't know how to do something, you come here and there's all of these videos on just how to do every specific thing. So that'll give you a lot of resources to help. And then they're always putting in new stuff. There's Earth Day that's coming up. Um, you know, there was a, there's an Easter one, all of these types of lessons and even by some different providers. So as always, you can search by grade, subject, content type, um, but you can also filter it by the standards up here. So if you're looking for something for a particular standard, you can search for it because there's so much content, it can get overwhelming. But we, what we wanna talk about is digital citizenship and literacy. You also have the College and Career Exploration and the SEL. Um, so those are great libraries to check out as well. But if we come into the digital citizenship and literacy, you'll notice that there's a couple different types of activities um, or choices. In the activities here, right here, you can just choose to add to my lessons, which would put it in the my lessons, or if you want to preview it. So if we just look and say, well, let's just look what it says. These activities are usually just like one slide. This one has three. So they're usually just real short, but here's an activity and it gives you an about the activity. And then here's ideas preparing students. So if you're getting ready to do a lesson on doing research skills, then doing a quick Nearpod lesson about, okay, let's remember what we talked about, or here's some of the rules, the, the norms that we wanna have, um, then those you can just cover that in a Nearpod lesson right away. Let me go back to the library. This little kindergarten one was a better one just to show for activities. So here, this one is a lesson bundle. So you can look right here. If you have students that are sharing private information in the classroom, then you can just come real quick to right here, sharing private information. It's one slide and it's a draw. It says, what is it important to not share private information online? So here you can just have the kids check the box and you know do a lesson like that, or you could do it up on the board. But it's just really easy to have these tools available just to spark that conversation to help you. So you don't have to create a slide or a checkbox or any of those things. And then we have um, videos that you can use and the same thing, the videos are bundled into lessons or little mini videos. The videos run from anywhere from two to eight minutes. Um, so media balance, saying goodbye to technology, 
pause and think online. So again, when you have those situations that happen in the, in the classroom, oh yeah, I think we're having a trouble with what we're saying online or in our, in our comments, if you're using you know, uh, com comments in Canvas or, or Google Classroom, um, you can use some of these and let's talk about that and to get that conversation going. Okay, and then these are the, the bundles of the digital citizenship. So you can see they're by grade. I'll stop moving my mouse so you can see. They're in Spanish, so that's really great. Um, they, they're done by grade band. So if we look at digital citizenship, grades two through five, and again, it's a bundle, is seeing is believing, password power up, rings of responsibility. So you have all of these just different little nuggets that you can talk about. So instead of having somebody come in once a year and do a net safe assembly and say, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Now you've got some talking points you can use with the kids. They're all, they kind of all revolve around six different main themes. Um, and so there's one, one lesson per theme for that theme area per grade level. So we can talk about social media. So if you're social media for upper grades, then there's lessons on Snapchat, Wikipedia, YouTube. So instead of teaching the kids that all social media is evil and bad, you can find one different platform and talk about the pros and cons. And what I like, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute, is that it allows the kids to make suggestions and talk about it. So rather than us telling them what to do, these the kids have to listen to some things and then kind of figure out what's good and what's bad. So you can see we have lots of different content areas. Now in my library, I have saved one. I saved it to my library and this one is Google search. So we're just gonna preview this to show some of the conversations that you have. So this is Google search. And so that's, there's always an essential question. How can I use Google search responsibly and effectively? Because I am a big fan of Utah's online library. I love it, but we know that kids always go back to Google, which is fine if we teach them how to use it responsibly and effectively. And sometimes they just don't really know some of the things about Google. And this, I really like this one because it talked about some of the things that kids need to be aware of. So it has the learning objectives, and let's get started. So today's lesson, we're gonna, and it talks about making it a powerful search platform. This has 43 slides. We're not gonna go through all of them, but I wanna show you some of the, the interactive parts of it. Okay, so here's an open-ended question. What's one benefit and one danger of using Google search whenever you need to find something? And I love having these kind of conversations when I'm in a classroom working with kids because they'll come up with things that I never even thought about. And here they can write it up on here and you know they type it in on their computer and then you talk about those things. So it's the students are talking about it. Okay. And then it goes, talks about the Google effect. And there's a really good video in here that talks about how your brain works when you're remembering things versus retrieving things. So it really helps kids to understand. We've been having a lot of discussion about um, chat GPT and artificial intelligence, right? And whether kids are just going and having chat GPT write something out for them. Well, that's just retrieving information. We want students to be able to recall information and actually learn it. So this is a really great video that shows how, how that works. And then, so after they watch that video, so what are some of the reasons you might turn to, to Google to find information or resources? So let the kids come, what kind of things are they looking for? And I always use this as an example when I'm comparing with Utah's online library. If I'm looking for the latest Justin Bieber video, a funny cat video, a cake recipe, or see who won the masters last Sunday, then I'm probably gonna go to Google and, and look and find some of those things. But if I'm trying to do research, okay, right. and a great example that I use is go to Google and search bears, B-E-A-R-S, and you're gonna get the football teams, you're gonna get the social media accounts, you're gonna get so much stuff. Go to Utah's online library and use Gale or EBSCO and type in bears and you're probably gonna get bears, the animals. So 
I always tell the kids, I don't have time to sort through a million results. You know, so what is it that I'm looking for and what's the best place for me to go? Because if we start telling kids, Google, you can't use Google, you know, you have to use this instead. We know that's not going to work, right? So giving kids voice and choice. Yes, I want to use Google for this. And now I know how to use it effectively. And so then we can take a poll. And so it's nice because you can see the results and you can show the results to the kids. You can hide the names or not. Um, you know, do we think a reliance on Google to find out information has a negative impact on your ability to remember information, right? Because why, why do I have to remember things when I can just Google it? Um, so we're having a conversation about that. And then it goes a lot into the history of Google with this part, and it talks about how it was developed and why it was developed. And if you can really get kids to understand that Google is not just there to serve up results for them, right? Google is actually a for-profit company. And how do they get their profits? Through advertising. So, you know, what, what are they trying to sell? Well, they're selling stuff to us. We're the consumers. And we need to get kids to realize that. And then there's a think pair share. See, if you aren't buying anything, you're the product, right? Okay. And so talking about who uses Google, over 60,000 searches per second. That's a lot. And then it kind of goes, there's this a website that shows statistics. So you can show the kids um, who's searching Google, what kind of use it's getting. And then again, what did you learn? So you can see that every time in this, you're having this conversation. And you don't even have to do this all in one class period. You could say, let's talk about this part. And then in the morning, we're going to finish or kind of get started and let the kids go on their own. And then they talk about Google search engine and it kind of gets into SEO, which is search engine optimization, but it's really kind of, it makes, helps you to understand why the results get to first, the, the first in when you do a Google search. It's not because those are the best results, right? It's because of the way those pages are ranked and, and what they've used. So it talks more about search engine. So if kids can understand why they're getting those results, um, then maybe hopefully they'll talk, you'll have better conversations about things like lateral reading, um, you know, re citing your sources, uh, you know, verifying, fact checking. And so then this is a fill in the blank. So now you can actually kind of check for make sure that they've understood. And again, all this comes back on a Google Doc that the kids get. And so, and so we're talking about searching responsibly. And even here, most efficiently, don't waste time clicking unhelpful links. And so here kind of it walks through different ways that you can look for things to help you be a better Google searcher. And it's not always just about safety with kids, because when you're searching on Google, we're not really talking about giving private information, but it's how can I best use my time? Because how many of us have gone down that rabbit hole on searching in Google and five hours later, I've not found what I wanted, but I've got some new shoes and a new recipe. But so teaching kids how to be effective, okay? And so then this one talks about search filters. And so what can you do to make your searches more targeted? And there's a whole lesson on this about using those search terms. So when I talked about bears, if I say, show me brown bears that live in Alaska, I'm gonna get better results than just saying bears, right? So teaching kids how to put in a good query. And then they have another poll. Okay, so then here they can, they have to talk about these different strategies. You know, what can you use? Okay, and then it kind of goes on talking more about the uh, search engine optimization, another think pair share. Um, so it goes quite a bit on, but you can see the different components in it where, you, you show something and then you talk about it and let the kids come to their own decisions. And then maybe at the end of the lesson, you say, okay, what should our classroom norms be? And make a, a poster up on the wall and say, okay, we agree, this is what we're gonna do, but have the kids come. Again, that's where that voice and choice comes from, letting the kids kind of leading them to those um, decisions. So I think you've kind of seen enough of the different types of things and we're got only got a few minutes left. And Liesl, do you have any questions or want to look for a certain topic area? Do they have anything on social? Yes, so I'm glad you asked. There's a whole section on social and emotional learning. 
And a lot of this is based on the castle, if you're familiar with that, C-A-S-E-L. Um, but here you have check-ins, mini lessons, full lessons, SEL through art, growth mindset. So if we just preview one, and again, I can preview it and look at it, or if I say, no, I already want that, I can just add it to my lesson, and then it's going to move it up to my lessons where I can edit it and present it. But let's look here, let's SEL in digital life, and that's K through 12. And this one's from Common Sense Media. So let's look at this one. Common Sense is what all the digital citizenship yeah. lessons yeah. we've been looking at it based off of. Very good, very good content. So gaming with positivity, uh, friendships in social media, friendships and boundaries online. So you can see saying goodbye to technology, our responsibilities online, my media balance. Boy, that would probably be a, an interesting one because I know that's something I've been working hard. I get that message on my face on my phone says your social media use, your screen time is down every month. And, and I know a lot of kids, we, that's what we talk about between the Chromebooks and their own social media, they're spending so much time online. But here's self-management. So this one's case will focus. I think most of that common sense is. So here's the learning objectives, learn the what, when, how much framework. And so drag the check mark to show which is closest to your mood right now. So the kids just want on their student side, once you launch the lesson, they have the tools and they can just drag it. So what a great way just to get a quick mood feeling or, or check in. And then talks about making choices. So, and then thinking about different activities, pick one activities and draw yourself. So the kids are really starting to connect it with themselves. I think that's what I like most about that because I have mentioned it a few times, but it's, it's not just, you know, pushing the information out saying, do this, don't do that. The kids actually have to think about their own actions and what they do and how they respond. Um, and then there's some think pair shares. Okay, healthy media choices. Okay, so that what a, could you imagine the conversations you could have with your kids? What makes a healthy good choice? Just like if you're talking about food choices or you know things that you say, um, you know it, it all applies whether it's digital or in person. And then here's a video. We won't take time to watch that, but what is media balance? How might it be different for some people? So just the fact that you're asking the kids questions and letting, letting them answer and, and think about it in their own words. So there's online activities so the kids could make a list of those different things. But yes, so you can see it follows the same process, introduce a topic, give some information on it, and then allow for some reflection. Does that answer your question, Liesl? Yeah, that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, you can see how many there are, you know, again, you've got the full lessons, mini lessons, those activities, those are just under five minutes. So could you imagine sharing those out, especially like with your special ed teachers or, you know, and just do a, a five minute emotion check. Or if you've got counselors, you know, kids are often maybe more prone to answering here and drawing those things out than actually, you know, talking with a, a counselor. So lots the of short stuff. lessons are a big advantage too, I think, because they're a little easier to work in. Right. And, and that's that's exactly the idea. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's what we need it to look like. We need it to say, oh, I, I see that we're all kind of struggling with this right now. Let's let's stop and have a conversation about this and let these tools help you to try and uh, support that conversation that you have with the kids. And like I said, they're completely editable. So if you think something's not really appropriate for your kids, or you can change it, you can add something. Um, but especially when there's any type of conflict, this is a great way to put it kind of into a third party that the kids can respond in Nearpod and may not be as intimidated to responding directly to you or to a counselor or, or somebody else. Okay, so let's go back to our slides because we've just got a few more. Did you have any more questions, Liesl, on Nearpod? No. Okay, Clint, anything you want to add? Nope. Good job. Okay. So I did put some resources. There's some new things in Nearpod. There's one that's Nearpod 3D, 
where, um, and they actually have student accounts now that if you set that up, kids can actually create. So imagine kids creating slideshows, but you can take any Google slideshow, you can create something in Google Slides, and you can make that a Nearpod with just a few clicks. Okay. There's 10 ways to use Nearpod in the classroom, and you'll see a little bit more about that at the end. But using for differentiated instruction, um, there's ways that you could deliver this material um, for, for different needs. There's the link for the UEN resources. They're available. They do a great that they have their one Nearpod page that Jamie Gardner's updating. And, and so always adding the new tools that come in. I know like client, Time to Climb, that's one of the, the, the fun features because it's kind of like a racing game for the kids. Um, there's Nearpod community, and they've actually got it set up now where if you join the community and you do certain activities, that's how you get your Nearpod certification. So super easy way to get your certification while you're using Nearpod without having to take a, an extra class. So you join the community and it kind of tracks what you're doing and, and shows you what you need to do next. Sometimes it's as simple as you know, giving a, a Nearpod instruction to three or more students or creating, adding an activity, okay? Um, and then we did the March Tuesday Tech Talk <laughs> on using the tool. So if you go back to that, that goes a little bit more deeper in actually how to build in Nearpod, which we didn't really cover because we were looking at content. Okay. Any questions? I didn't wait very long on that, did I? Chris, no, you're fine. I think we're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, yeah, real quick on our April choice boards. I forgot to talk about this last time because I didn't really build any slides. I was using the Google Demo Slam. But um, our choice board for this month is actually on Nearpod. Uh, I've linked to that same article that Chris linked to. Um, but it talks about 10 different ways to use Nearpod in the classroom. And I'd like you to uh, employ five of those. So send me a, a link to a student pace Nearpod lesson or a couple if you need to um, that shows that you've used those or just create a screencast recording where you just take me through the five that you used in your in your lessons and I'll give you a minus point for that. Sounds like a sweet deal. And thanks for Chris for noticing. I sent out earlier this same graphic, but it had 3, 4, 3, 11, So I changed the date. The days of the week, I just didn't change the month. So it looked like March dates. But uh, so that's, we're halfway through. Next week, we'll look at Google Forms. We'll walk through uh, the level one educator tasks on that. And just in the nick of time, because guess what Chris and I are doing yeah. next week? We are taking our Google One recertification. Our, well, we've had it for what, six years now? Uh, yeah, I think so. This is yeah. the third time we've redone it, yeah. yeah. So we're going to redo ours um, next week. Um, and so we'll go back through Google Forms. And then at the end of the month, Chris is going to take back over and I'll try to jump in. We'll take a look at Canva and their newish presentation tool uh, that that is just beautiful and lovely and, you know, Love trying to get me out of my Google Slides rut. So, <laughs> yeah, Canva, yeah, has just grown so much and it's just yeah. become such a great tool. Not to be confused with Canvas. That's right. And uh, if you want to talk about this one tomorrow. Um, yeah, you chat. You Ted chat is, I love it. It's great. It's 8 p.m. on Wednesday. So tomorrow night is going to be my pal, Michelle Maxwell from You Into High. She is, is an amazing teacher, librarian, and Utah fellows. And she does some great things with collaborating amongst teachers and, and librarians, not just teachers and librarians, but in general. So she'll be talking about how to collaborate. So I'm really looking forward to joining that UTED chat. Okay, and then we've got some good podcasts. Danny Sloan and Matt Winters do a great job with UEN Homeroom every month. And then I also added a slide in here, I believe, for the USAT podcast. And the current episode was live from the USAT conference. And they talked to uh, Brandon Harrison and a couple of our uh, folks who are newly elected to the USET board. So Kira does a good job with that as well. Yeah, she's pretty amazing. And Liesl, don't worry about signing the roll. I've already got you down. 
I will, it's nice where I'm not presenting. I can I can work in the background and do the stuff that I usually do afterwards. You had such a big group to take care yeah. of today. Well, that's why I just went ahead and did it for you. We appreciate you coming. And it's it's good for us to record this and make these resources available to folks that are watching it later on because they do take advantage of it. And we appreciate uh, anytime, anywhere you guys can uh, take the opportunity to learn. We're happy to help recognize and, and uh, help you with that where we can. So appreciate it. I hope to see you next week, Chris. Well done. Anything hey, else you'd like thanks. to add? Nope. Hey, happy, happy to stop the recording and